Good afternoon. Welcome to Good afternoon. Welcome to West Basin Municipal Water District Water Policy and Legislation Committee and Special Meeting of the Board of Directors for October, I'm sorry, for August 16th. Um, this committee meeting is called to order. Uh, Mr. General Manager, would you please um, call the roll? Director Don Deere. Here. Chairwoman Gloria Gray. Here. Director Scott Houston. Director Harold Williams. Here. Director Desi Alvarez. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, is there any public comment? Madam Chair, we have not received any requests for public comment, though this meeting is being held both in person and virtually. If there are any guests that would like to make public comment today virtually, please indicate so by raising your virtual hand. And Madam Chair, I do not see any requests for public comment. Thank you. Are there any presentations? Madam Chair, we do not have any presentations today. Item five, any action calendar items? And staff has no action items today. Item six, information calendar. 6A, legislative update for July 2023. Uh, Mr. Caldwell, please. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, uh, this is our monthly legislative update. And uh, we have Matthew Bay, our manager of water policy and resources development here for the presentation. All right. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, EJ. Um, the legislative update begins on page three of the agenda packet and printed copies of the monthly state and federal reports along with the state bill tracking report were provided to the directors. And I believe we're also making uh, copies of those materials available in the chat today. Um, so before I get into my state report, I, I did want to provide an, up, uh, an update on a dis uh, discussion topic that had been requested by President Houston. Um, the topic is related to water treatment chemical costs. And staff has now researched this issue at both the state and federal levels. Um, and my research has involved working with our operations team, specifically Uzi Daniels and Susanna Lee, who have helped me analyze the cost trends and also explore um, some of the actions that have been taken to date, either via legislation or through regulations. So as, as this board knows, the cost of chemicals rose dramatically in 2021 and 2022. And this has significantly impacted our, our budget, along with the budgets of pretty much any water supplier in the country um, that uses chemicals such as chlorine uh, for the treatment of our water supplies. Uh, the reasons for the cost increases are many, um, but one of the primary drivers was due to the loss of production from chemical manufacturers. Some of the major producers closed up shop uh, over the last couple of years. Um, and then in another example, a manufacturer suffered a, a facility accident that shut down their operations for a while as well. And while the overall picture on the costs of, of chemicals is still not the best, one bit of good news in all of this is that costs do seem to have leveled off a bit for the, at least for the time being. So as part of this research process, I checked in with both our state and federal advocacy teams and also reached out to state and federal um, coalition partners to see what actions, if any, they're hearing about being taken on this issue. So on the state side, I reached out to Aqua's regulatory staff who is very active on issues like this. Um, and while Aqua was engaged on this issue with a host of other agencies in 2021, um, around the time when these shortages were first being reported, um, there's been, there hasn't been as much action kind of since, since that initial period of time. Um, according to Aqua, it doesn't seem to be as widespread um, and of impact uh, across their membership the way that it was in 2021 and early 2022. Um, however, I, I wanted to explore a little bit further, and so I talked with our uh, state advocacy team um, to see if they've been hearing anything on the legislative levels. They also um, didn't hear or, or turn up any active efforts to evaluate or address the issue at the state legislative level. 
Um, also worked with our operations team to communicate with AWWA to determine whether there's, there's any federal efforts that are underway with regard to chem, uh, chemical costs. And overall, the federal engagement does seem to be slightly greater uh, compared to state efforts at this time. Um, but again, just there's not a whole lot of concerted action going on right now. They seem to be more um, predisposed with PFAS and, and you know, Chrome 6 and, and issues like that. Chemical cost is just not top of mind for everybody right now. Um, AWWA did provide, provide me with a copy of a letter that was sent to the EPA in April of this year, raising concerns over proposed rulemaking with regard to certain chemical production processes. Uh, a copy of that letter was provided to the directors as part of today's materials. Um, however, further discussion that I did have with AWWA seemed to indicate that it's really a huge challenge for anything of substance to be done with regard to addressing the cost issue without getting into market control. Um, and that obviously is a very sensitive and, and political issue. Um, not to say that people aren't thinking about it, but how they go about it, uh, they have to be very careful. Um, AWWA has offered to continue conversations with us about potential future legislative options and staff will continue to check in with them from time to time. Um, and so while this process did not turn up the type of information that I was looking for, it did kind of shed some light onto how this issue is being viewed in both California and in Washington, D.C. So we'll con uh, continue to track this, is, uh, this issue. We've asked our state and federal lobbyists to bring any updates um, to us uh, on this matter of chemical costs. And I'll, of course, be bringing any updates to the board whenever warranted or whenever requested. Are there any questions about um, this chemical cost issue before I move on? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Matt, Ma Madam Chair. Director William, yes. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I was just wondering, um, with some of the landfills are having problems now with odors, really bad, not here particularly, but uh, a little further north, and they're looking at, um, uh, so I guess some of the chemicals that we would be using uh, to uh, kind of uh, put the uh, cap on that. I was just wondering if, if we've seen any or heard of anybody uh, having an impact uh, because of what's happening with the uh, uh, landfills. I know in general, uh, in, we're seeing this more on the, the PFAS side, um, but yeah, the, the, the types of landfills, the types of substances that they're taking in and allowing um, those are also being impacted and we're finding shortages of places to take these time, kinds of materials as well. So I think it is an industry wide issue that they're that they're dealing with. And, you know, states don't necessarily want to allow that to you know, be coming into their borders. And so right. um, that's that's definitely an ongoing issue that's impacting this and, and PFAS and other um, uh, you know, regulatory mechanisms uh, with regard to chemicals and disposal. So it's amazing how PFAS was just kind of a couple years ago, just kind of, hey, and now <laughs> you can't turn without hearing about it. It is the issue. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, but um, for, um, for recycled water, for uh, uh, irrigation, that would become a, a, an issue later on by uh, depending on the amount that we put down, right? In terms of if the amount of beef for oh. us, we don't put we don't we don't make drinking water, right? But we do produce recycled water. Yeah, I think it impacts us more in terms of like our solids handling and disposal because um, that's kind of been the byproduct that mm -hmm. gets taken out to those to those landfills. And then also we see some of that show up in our treatment um, me media. So kind of the leftover what's in our cartridges and our filters and things like that. Mm -hmm. So those are the areas that um, from what I hear from our operations folks, those are the areas where they're uh, more concerned. Thank you. All right. Um, there's no other questions at all. Any more questions? 
All right. All right. So I'll go ahead. Thank you. Okay. I'll move on to the state update. Um, you don't have an agenda packet number, but it, uh, in your materials, it's the report that's titled uh, Niamela Office and Associates Report. And so the state legislature resumed their legislative uh, session on Monday of this week, coming back from a month long recess. They'll have about a month to go through the remaining bills that are still alive. Um, a major remaining step is the appropriations committee, which evaluates the estimated cost of enacting the various legislative measures. Uh, the governor has also indicated that he could continue to be heavy handed with his veto pen this year on bills with high costs. We've seen that already occur earlier this year when a number of bills were, were kind of stopped at appropriations in the original houses. Um, and then on the regulatory front, I do have a couple of updates for you today. So first, uh, the state water board announced in July uh, proposed reg regulations related to direct potable reuse of recycled water. Uh, this is something that the industry has been tra tracking for a long time. Um, and before the proposed regulations are finalized, they must go through public comment, uh, a public hearing, which is tentatively to be held on September 7th, and then some level of peer review. The goal is to conduct a board vote on the regulations by the end of the year and for the new regs to go into effect by April of next year. However, that timeline is still somewhat flexible. Um, so far, there doesn't seem to be any major concerns coming from the water and public health industries on the proposed regulations, which, which is good. So staff will continue to track that issue and provide updates leading up to the final uh, state water board adoption that's expected in December. The second regulatory update relates to the uh, conservation as a California way of life water use regulations. These are the pending uh, regs that would require retail water providers to meet specific water use objectives within their service areas, including residential indoor use, residential outdoor use, uh, CII outdoor use, and water loss. Um, several delays have impacted the adoption of the regulations, which may push back some of the dates by which retailers have to begin to report and comply with those regulations. Uh, it was expected that those would start to fall in place this fall, but it's looking more now like that may be delayed once again. We are hearing that the state water board continues to discuss the issue of variances for recycled water use, uh, which is an area of interest for West Basin as a regional recycled water producer. Um, our staff continues to be very active in trying to understand these regs and helping our region prepare for them. We're in the process of working with our retailers to help them get a handle on what's coming down the line in terms of compliance and reporting. Um, we're currently partnering with a subject matter expert who will provide an overview of the requirements to not only our staff, um, but also our retailers in the next month or two. Um, kind of waiting for the, the regulations to be finalized before we, we hold that, um, that uh, webinar. Um, and then our department also hopes to have one on one meetings with our municipal and county retailers uh, to determine their specific needs and to answer any questions that they have with regard to those regs. So once things are, are finalized at the state level, uh, we expect to see things ramp, ramp up over the next six to 12 months as reporting becomes due for the retailers. Um, with the legislature now back in session, we expect climate bond discussions to also ramp up. Some activity took place during the summer break uh, with climate bond listening sessions being held throughout the state, including one that was held in LA County that was hosted by LA County Public Works and the Resources Legacy Fund. Um, we continue to be very, very engaged on this issue with our coalition partners, um, including Water Reuse, Aqua, CalWEP, uh, Metropolitan Water District, and we're currently uh, doing a few different things. We're developing a fact sheet that we could use in our lobbying efforts. Um, and we're also working very closely with water reuse um, and Metropolitan to introduce language in the proposed bond that would fund state investments in recycled water projects that enhance existing recycled water treatment systems and technology optimizations that enable us to maintain the reliability and production capabilities of our recycled water facilities. A lot of the times, um, you know, bonds go toward new supplies, new, you know, new water sources, but it's really important to us to see 
that the state invests in these other things that help maintain the recycled water that we already are producing. Um, and so that's one of the things that we're working very hard to get in the, in the, uh, the language. We don't know if we're going to be successful, but we're working very hard with, with our partners to try to get that to happen um, for next year's uh, water bond measure. Uh, water reuse, who, who I said we've been working with, they're seeking $1.8 billion for recycled water in the bond. Um, however, the actual number that the legislature approves for the measure will likely be lower. Um, to qualify for the March 2024 ballot, a bond would have to pass two thirds of the legislature by the sept uh, September 14th deadline of this year and be signed by the governor. However, if we go to the November 2024 ballot, the bond could be passed by the legislature and Governor Newsom as late as next summer, which would kind of give everyone more time to work out the details of the bond. Uh, Governor Newsom has indicated a preference for a different bond that he's running, the mental health bond, to go on the March 2024 ballot by itself, which would then probably push any climate bond to the November ballot. Uh, as for other legislative updates, I wanted to touch on a bill that this board su uh, supported earlier this year, but that didn't make it out of its House of Origin. Um, that bill is AB 735 by Assemblymember Mark Berman, uh, and this was a utilities workforce development bill. I know this was something um, that Director Gray had, had really uh, expressed an interest in, and so I just wanted to report back on that. Uh, the bill is currently on pause, um, and it could certainly come back in a, next year in a new body, which we hope we hope it will. Uh, but we know that workforce development is an issue of great importance to this board. So staff will continue to engage on this issue in the coming months during the break, the legislative break, including uh, speaking with the author's office about the need for the bill. You know, again, which hopefully we can get it back um, onto the legislative. Um, into the next legis uh, legislative session, uh, how it will support our industry and many of the students and young professionals from the communities that we serve. So staff will keep the board apprised of any uh, progress or updates on, on that effort with uh, the workforce development bill. And then because the legislature has been on break this, this past month, I don't have any other uh, specific bill updates at this time that differ from last month's report. Um, but you can't expect a more detailed breakdown of our bills of interest at the next committee meeting. Um, otherwise, you can review the updated bill report that was provided as part of this month's uh, materials. And then I also wanted to mention that our staff is working with LA County to apply for a state resiliency grant called the Integrated Climate Adaptation and Resiliency Program. So this, this new grant program provides up to 100% funding, so no cost share, and it prioritizes projects that include multi-jurisdiction partnerships and those that focus on disadvantaged communities. Um, the proposed project would include work in the Kenneth Hahn Park area, and it would include grass replacement, uh, tree plantings, water bottle filling station uh, installations, uh, among many other resiliency projects that the county is, is proposing to do. The grant's due at the end of this month, and we're expected to be a co-applicant on that application with LA County. Uh, it's highly competitive. There's only one or two grants in each region of California that, that will get the funding. Um, but should we be successful, it'd be a great opportunity for us to partner with the county on a project with great value to the community. Uh, that concludes my state report. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions on any state issues before I move on to the federal report. Okay, Matt, thank you. Are there any questions? And Matt, uh, just a couple of comments. I think that's a wonderful uh, um, effort to partner with the council uh, uh, the uh, funding for in uh, for uh, Kenton Park. So I commend the you guys for for even wanting to do that with the county because this can really be helpful already in my district. Uh, I do have a question about the workforce development bill. Well, you yes. said it's on pause. Do you have any information as to why it's on pause? Well, it, it had a um, a fiscal impact, and so it, it got held up in the appropriations a couple of months ago. So that was this year. Governor Newsom was especially strict with any uh, measures that would propose fund, you know, funding impact, and so it got yeah, it got held up in appropriations. So, and remind me, who's the author on that bill? Uh, Assemblymember Berman. Berman, and where is she from? 
I believe he's, I want to say he's from Northern California. I don't, I don't think he's so, I don't think he's so Cal. I think he's Northern California, but um, we could certainly, yeah, find that out for okay. you. What's oh, Southern oh. California? Palo, Al Palo Alto. Okay. What Southern California legislators have are, are co-signers on the bill? Do you have co-signers on the bill now? I'd have to look at that, but I would imagine that Reggie uh, Jones Sawyer would be somebody who would be highly supportive of that bill. Um, and we could also probably speak with uh, Assemblymember uh, Gibson as well. I think those would be two um, that, that we could talk with. Uh, we might also have plans for a bill next year. Um, those are the ones that come to my mind, EJ. I don't know if you have any. No, those are, are spot on. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, Director Gray, uh, as Matt said, uh, with the expected uh, revenue shortfall as far as the budget goes, uh, this pro or this bill actually created a new program to, to kind of work on workforce development. And so the concept of, of creating new programs in a year where uh, you know you're going to have a budget crunch. It just becomes extremely difficult. Uh, this bill didn't make it too far in the legislative process, but as Matt said, you know we're we're hopeful that we can uh, maybe breathe some life into it next year. And that was the reason for uh, staff's recommendation uh, that the board of directors take a support position on because the bill was actually dead, I believe, before we we took an action uh, the day before. So we just felt that this was a cause that we wanted to support. And so that was the reason behind staff's recommendation. And we're going to continue to work on it, as Matt said. Yeah. Uh, was there anyone that signed off opposing the bill at this point? No, no, nope. no opposition. OK, and and so it won't be considered until the next term for, uh, for legislation. Is that what you guys are saying? Yeah, it, it wasn't made into a two year bill, so it, it would kind of have to come back as a as a new proposal next year. So someone would have to create it, create it again as a new bill. Yeah, correct? yeah, they you know, they could use kind of the start with the same language, but I think they would have to make some up. Yeah, some updates to it uh, in, a, okay. in a new vehicle. Yeah. All right. OK, well, whatever you can do to keep us surprised of it. And I'm certainly interested in it. All right, thank you. Any other, any questions or comments about the state report? If not, Matthew, can you go on to the uh, federal yes. report, please? Thank you. Okay, yes, uh, thank you, Chair Gray. Um, now moving on to federal issues. So printed copies of the monthly federal report were provided to directors and are also available or will be available in the chat. And it's with uh, the report with the heading of Vance Goyak Associates. So Congress is currently on its summer recess and set to come back after the Labor Day weekend. Uh, progress is being made on, on passing fiscal year 2024 congressional appropriations bills. However, there's still a bit of work to do, which makes the possibility of a short or long term continuing resolution, which provides a temporary budget stop gap highly likely. Uh, the goal of Congress would be to try to get all the funding bills passed by the end of the calendar, uh, calendar year, or at least by the beginning of, of um, 2024. On July 19th, the Senate Natural Resources Subcommittee on Water and Power held a hearing to discuss a number of Western focused water bills. One of those was uh, Senate Bill 2162, which is Senator Feinstein's Stream Act, which would reauthorize a number of different Western water programs including recycled water and desalination. This is a bill that West Basin's board has a support position on. The Senate is also holding hearings on the 2024 Water Resources Development Act with a focus on climate change and how it is affecting drought and rising sea levels. It's also evaluating how to optimize uh, U.S. Army Corps operations to reflect the new challenges of, of climate change. And the Army Corps is, of course, who we work with on many of our lateral uh, Harbor South Bay projects. Um, we talked about PFAS a little bit earlier. Um, these forever chemicals continue to be a, a big issue for the water industry, and West Basin is actively working with our partners to ensure that we're engaged at the state and federal level 
and working together to protect the industry against any potential liabilities that would be borne by uh, that should be borne by PFAS manufacturers and not uh, water utilities. Uh, West Basin's board previously took a support position on Senate uh, Bill 1430, which is the Water Systems PFAS Liability Protection Act, which is intended to shield water utilities from any Superfund costs that may arise in the future. We're also working in coordination with Metropolitan Water District, Water Reuse, um, Aqua, and other national coalition members to seek out exemptions for water utilities, which has included sending letters to a Senate committee um, that oversees the issue, as well as to the offices of our two senators, uh, Diane Feinstein and Alex Padilla. That is something that uh, Metropolitan is taking a lead on, and they were looking to their member agencies to send their own letters. Uh, so we we uh, we heeded that call and sent letters to uh, to the two senators on that issue. Uh, yesterday, West Basin Water Policy and Operations staff both attended a meeting that was put on by Aqua to hear updates on PFAS litigation that is currently occurring for drinking water providers. While West Basin is not directly impacted by this issue right now, it was helpful to hear what other water agencies are, are dealing with and the alternatives that they're considering to ensure that they and their ratepayers uh, do not bear the costs of, of PFAS cleanup, uh, which again should be the responsibility of manufacturers like 3M and, and DuPont. I also have a couple of updates on the Colorado River. Yesterday, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation released its 24-month projections for Lake Powell and Lake Mead, which they do this on an annual basis, and they announced that it will reduce water use restrictions on the states of Arizona and Nevada starting in October, which is the beginning of the new water year, uh, due to the wet winter and improved reservoir levels. Uh, the lower basin will now be under a less serious Tier 1 shortage, which is the lowest level shortage for that basin. Um, Lake Mead is expected to be at an, at an elevation of 1,065 feet on January 1st of next year, which is an improvement of nearly 20 feet from last year's projections. Uh, based on the improved conditions, the larger cuts that Arizona and Nevada had this year under a Tier 2A shortage will uh, be reduced next year. Um, and throughout this, California hasn't been affected by any cuts. Um, and they'll continue to be exempt from any cuts under the current uh, Colorado River Drought Contingency Plan operating guidelines. Um, in other funding news, uh, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation announced funding for its annual Water Smart program, with nearly $200 million being available through the infrastructure funding package that passed in 2021. $55 million will go toward drought resiliency projects, while $35 million will go toward planning and design of projects. In addition, uh, FEMA um, recently announced cybersecurity funding opportunities for state and local government agencies. Of the $380 million available, 80% must go to local governments, including special districts, for defending against cybersecurity threats. Uh, West Basin is looking into and evaluating all of these grant opportunities. Uh, more recently, uh, the water policy team and, and our engineering teams have been meeting together with our federal advocacy uh, team BSA on a consistent basis to explore all potential grant opportunities for the purposes of helping fund um, some of our feasibility studies, facility upgrades, planning and design needs, and water conservation programs. West Basin intends to apply for one or more grant programs this fall. And with that, that concludes my federal update. Uh, additional federal issue of um, Report issues can be found in the monthly BSA report. Uh, I'd be happy to take any, any uh, other questions from the board. There's no questions. Well, thank you. Right. Madam Chair, are we OK to move forward? Madam Chair, I believe you're on mute. Okay. Yes, please move forward. Okay. Can you hear me? The next item that we, yes, we can. The next item that we have for you is item 6B under the information counter. It's our monthly Metropolitan Water District program update. And for this presentation, we have Tammy Hurley High, our water policy and resources analyst, uh, here for the presentation. 
Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Gray, Member Deer, and Director Williams. So this report includes a summary of metropolitan water district activities that are of interest to West Basin. And included uh, in this report this month are presentation slides, um, which I'd also like to use to help uh, guide in the discussion. Um, so these presentation slides, uh, they begin on page 16 of the committee packet. Um, and I have four items um, of note to provide a summary to you. So the first one is the annual water quality report. So last month, Metropolitan released their annual drinking water quality report. It summarizes the monitoring data for 2021. And Metropolitan's distribution system maintains the Phase 4 Excellence in Distribution System Award for achieving the highest level of optimization and protecting the reliability and safety of the system. The Metropolitan is a participating member of the Partnership for Safe Water Program, which is a cooperative effort among six national drinking water organizations, which focus on improving the water quality of drinking water by optimizing distribution system operations. And uh, a link is also provided in the written report to access a copy online for those interested. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, the second item is a uh, look at the climate adaptation master plan for water. So Metropolitan staff has been engaging with the board and its member agencies toward development of a comprehensive climate master plan for water. Um, but we also refer to this as the CAMP process, is the acronym CAMP. So this slide shows the planning process. And this effort began last February during the board retreat, where they discussed uh, reassessing how Metropolitan would define the core concepts of the climate change impact that are related to water supply resiliency, reliability, financial sustainability, and affordability. So since then, they have coordinated several workshops with the board and committees. And the <laughs> areas uh, are where it indicates where they are right now in this process. And recently, Metropolitan staff um, has engaged both the member agencies and the board um, in an effort to gain a mutual understanding um, and agreement on the terminology that will be used moving forward towards the planning document that they are developing. Um, the terminology will evaluate the climate master plan, the criteria, and also identify scenario planning. Also, they have reviewed recently the integrated regional plan, the IRP, um, the needs assessment to define the range of water supply needs for a potential climate change scenarios, and they will also be using this as a tool to evaluate the water supply and shortage solutions in this planning process. So this is a very comprehensive um, planning effort and it will continue in the next uh, coming months through several different phases. So we will continue to keep you apprised and updated as to how this is evolving and developing. So the next item on the next slide, uh, just wanted to point out that in July, on July 25th, the Metropolitan staff had presented a very comprehensive overview of the Bay Delta. Um, this included a lot of uh, items that are listed here on their agenda. This was a two, um, two and a half hour workshop, uh, it was pretty lengthy, but it really just kind of coalesced everything that goes on. Um, and metropolitan activities over the past several years along the Delta. And so just for those interested, a copy of the presentation slides are uh, also can be accessed online and that link is provided in the written report for those interested. And then the next item is the proposed tree rebate program. So uh, in July, Metropolitan staff presented a new option that could be included in their existing turf removal rebate program, which would include rebates on trees. And that concept emerged from the Water Use Efficiency Program Advisory Committee, which is comprised of member agencies and local retail agencies as well. And they look at new technologies and review potential programs. So they brought this forward to Metropolitan staff for consideration. And uh, the staff had brought that to the board and committees 
um, in July, as I had mentioned, uh, for information and then also uh, more feedback. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So the board, uh, they've gained a lot of positive feedback on this program, and uh, the board did end up approving this just this month, just yesterday at their board meeting. So there will be a new rebate available for trees, and this would be available to both residential and commercial properties. The rebate amount would be $100, and the, the program would allow for a rebate of up to five trees. Um, it would only be available to those who are applying for the turf removal rebate program. And one new tree would be the equivalent of three new plants. That's how they kind of work that into the program. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to share that a little bit of good news. And so just for the board agenda, look ahead. Uh, this is what they had listed on their board meeting for August. Um, they just had that yesterday. So one was to approve the nomination and renaming of Metropolitan Pure Water Southern California demonstration plant, which is now the Representative Grace Napolitano Pure Water Southern California Innovation Center. Um, just wanted to point that out. Uh, they did adopt a resolution establishing the ad valorem tax rate uh, for fiscal year 23-24. And also um, the uh, assessed valuation reporting was available yesterday in this information has been provided to the West Basin Board uh, for your information as well. Um, and then I can provide a little bit more um, written report on that next month. Um, and then they also discussed a discussion on phase one draft long range finance plan. It would be their first discussion. They will have another discussion. And then this is going to be a process they'll look to um, consider adopting a long-range finance plan towards the end of this calendar year. Um, they really want to spend a lot more time um, weighing in on a lot, of, a lot of the aspects that are related to that. Um, and that's pretty much it. So we go to the water supply update. And on the last slide, we have um, just a look at the graphs that we show every month. Um, so on the green shaded area in the state water project for Lake Oroville, the reservoir uh, shown, it indicates 3.54 million acre feet in storage. And Lake Oroville currently has um, uh, 1,000, or I'm sorry, 1.79 million acre feet more in storage compared to last year. And the San Luis Reservoir also remains full and it has 490 5,000 acre feet more compared to last year. And looking at the blue shaded area for the Colorado River resources, Lake Powell's forecast for the inflow is 145% of normal. And then, um, let's see the list here. So Lake Mead, their elevation so has also been increasing and you heard um, from that it will continue to increase. Um, so that's good news. Um, so Metropolitan does have a water supply surplus, as I mentioned um, last month, and they have, as you know, 100% allocation on the state water project and the supply from the Colorado River. Um, and then with their demand, they're really just half of what their supplies are. So Metropolitan does expect to end this year with record amounts of storage in their dry year storage account, all the way upwards of 3.4 million acre feet. Um, and they continue to manage this excess supply to meet future demand of water. And they're working with their member agencies to um, deliver um, more water into the groundwater uh, system and local groundwater basins. Um, and they anticipate uh, delivering over 1 million acre feet into storage this year. Uh, so that's good news. They're, they're working hard to try to find a home for all of this water. <coughs> So that concludes this report. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Sammy. Are there any questions? No. Hearing, hearing none. Uh, EJ, can you go to the next item on the agenda, please? Madam Chair, that concludes our information calendar. Uh, the next item that we have on the agenda is closed session, and we do not have any closed session items, which brings us to uh, director's comments or future agenda items. Okay, thank you. 
Directors, do you have comments? Director Williams or our dear? Hearing none, I'd just like to thank staff this morning for your Veritorial report. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, we will adjourn this meeting. Thank you very much, staff and board members. Bye-bye.